Good evening. My name is Erin Blankenship, and I am the Interim Executive Director at the Florida Holocaust Museum. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this important presentation with author Jeffrey Sussman. Before we begin, I want to thank the museum's Community Outreach and Programs Manager, Miranda Brenner, Media Producer, Brett Henriksen, Communications and Marketing Manager, David Myers, and IT Manager, Amy Baruch, as well as our entire programming team for their work on making this event successful. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanna let you know that after his presentation, Mr. Sussman will take your questions. If you have one, please type it in the comment section below. And as always, we will be sharing a QR code at the end of his presentation. If you scan it, it will take you to an online survey. And we would be so grateful if you would take two minutes to tell us what you thought of the presentation. These surveys help us plan future events like this one and let our sponsors know how we are doing so that we can be successful in our next round of grant applications. And now let's hear from our speaker. Jeffrey Sussman is the author of 15 nonfiction books. His most recent book is Holocaust Fighters, Boxers, Resisters, and Avengers. He has also written about the history of Jewish boxers in America. While a college student, Jeffrey worked as a part-time secretary to novelist and short story author Isaac Basheva Singer. His book about Max Bayer, the partially Jewish boxer, is being made into a movie, which, if all goes well, should be released in 2024. Jeffrey lives with his wife, Barbara, and dog Archie in New York City. So please help me welcome Jeffrey Sussman. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. My uh, book, Holocaust, Fighters, Boxers, Resisters, and Avengers, grew out of my interest in Jewish boxing. And while I was researching my book on Jewish boxers, I came across the boxers who had to fight for their lives in Nazi concentration camps. And it was a, it was a, a terrible and in some ways depressing thing to find out about and yet these people were marvelous to the extent that they had such a strong survival instinct they were able to keep going regardless of what terrible things were happening to them and the, I, I profiled five of these uh, boxers in my book and the first one whom I uh, profiled was a man named Victor Perez known as Victor Young Perez he was a Jew from Tunis and became the youngest European flyweight boxing champion. He became so successful that he became a celebrity in pre-war France and became the lover of a major French movie star at that time named Morel Balin. And they were the celebrity couple of their day. They were photographed in magazines and newspapers. They were photographed going shopping on the Champs-Élysées, going to theaters, going to nightclubs, et cetera. And, uh, but he, after he achieved his championship, he became such a celebrity that he began to lead a dissipated life. And that led to him losing his title. And things only got worse for him after the Nazis invaded and took over France. His mistress, Morel Ballin, uh, was very opportunistic. And she wanted to make sure that her career continued as it had been going. And so she abandoned Victor Young Perez and started an affair with an SS soldier named Burl Desbach. And as bad as that was for Victor Perez, what was even worse was that she betrayed him and alerted the SS to where he was hiding. And Perez had been under the illusion that his celebrity would protect him from the Nazis, which is why he rejected his brother's call to come back to Tunis, where he felt he would have been safe. And after he was betrayed, he was arrested and sent to first to Drancy and then to Auschwitz, and from Auschwitz to an Auschwitz subcamp called Monowitz. And there he was regularly beaten and nearly starved to death. 
And one of the first things they did there, uh, because he had been a professional fighter, they forced him to fight an enormous SS guard who was well over six feet tall. And being a flyweight, you can understand that Victor Perez was a very small man, maybe 5'3", five, 5'4", five, weighing 110 to 115 pounds. And th this man was beating him terribly. And th the camp guards invited a number of Jewish prisoners to observe the fight. They were told that they couldn't lift their faces to look at the fight, but they managed to look up through their eyes, raising their eyes and their eyebrows to look at what was going on. And they saw this champion whom they admired being really badly beaten. And they started slowly whispering and then getting louder and louder, saying his name over and over again. Young, 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 they kept calling him. And, and this inspired Victor, and he was able to beat the man who was beating him. And that resulted in his having to fight on a regular basis thereafter. He, he was constantly put in the ring and forced to fight men who were much bigger than he was. After that, they put him in a, in a, in a ring with other Auschwitz prisoners, men who were starving and who could barely hold themselves up, yet they were forced to fight this other man. And the terrible thing for Victor Perez is that he knew that his opponents, if they lost, would be killed. And if he lost, he would be killed. So it was a terrible dilemma for him. Should I fight or shouldn't I fight? If he didn't fight, he would be killed. So he had to fight and he had to win just to survive. And over a period of 15 months, he had 140 knockouts. Then towards the end of the war, as you probably know, there were these terrible death marches where Jews were forced to go on these marches outside of the camps, often back to Germany, where they would be forced to work in munitions factories. On, on the march out of Monowitz, Perez was walking down a road with all the other prisoners, and he spotted a loaf of bread on the side of the road. He ran to get it, thinking that he would feed himself and several of his colleagues who were marching with him. An SS guard saw him, ran up behind him, and shot him in the back of the head and killed him. And that was the end of Victor Perez. The next person who I profiled was a man named Nathan Chapow, who was from Riga, Latvia. He was a natural athlete. He participated in many different sports and was extremely proficient at all of them. He trained at a Jewish boxing club in Riga called the Maccabee Club. And he, he managed to inspire the hatred of the Nazis who had taken occupation of the town. They didn't like him because he was so athletic and he carried himself with a great deal of pride. And there was one particular SS man who really despised Nathan Chapow. His, his name was Hoffman. And he was determined that he was going to destroy Chapow. And he was determined that he would beat Chapow to death. And one day he followed Chapow into his apartment and spread eagled him against the wall and was hitting him around the, the face and then backed away. And Chapow heard the man unbuckle his holster, which contained a Luger pistol. Hoffman, all of his, uh, uh, Chapow all of a sudden realized that Hoffman was going to kill him. He quickly turned around and hit Hoffman as hard as he could, knocking him unconscious. He then was going to take the gun and shoot Hoffman, but he realized that the sound of gunfire would draw SS troops to his small abode. So instead, he grabbed a lamp and began to pummel Hoffman, hitting him over and over again on the head until he fractured his skull and he was sure that Hoffman was dead. In the middle of the night, around three o'clock in the morning, he wrapped Hoffman's body in a shroud and dragged it several blocks away and dumped it in an alley, hoping that it would not be found. However, SS soldiers found it the next day and they gathered up all the Jewish men in Riga, as many of them as they could, and brought them to the town square and said that if 
the person who killed Hoffman didn't step forward and admit to his crime that two innocent Jews would be brought to the center of the town and they would be hanged. Well, here, here's another example of a man forced to make a terrible decision. If Nathan Chapow admitted to what he had done, he would have been executed. If he doesn't admit it, two innocent men are going to be executed. And he didn't admit it. So two innocent Jewish men were brought into the center of the town, put on a platform, ropes were tied around their necks. The platform was kicked out from under, <clears throat> under them and they were hanged until they were dead. This haunted uh, Chapow for the rest of his life. He felt terribly guilty about it, but there was nothing that he could do. And he knew that the Nazis were just going to kill everyone they could get their hands on. There were 25,000 Jews of Riga who were rounded up and they were taken to a place called the Rambala Forest, where all 25,000 of them were executed. Chapow managed to avoid <coughs> that execution, but he was caught and he was taken to a place called the Kaiserwald concentration camp. And because he was so athletic, here again, like with Victor Perez, he was forced to fight men who were bigger and stronger than he was. And the first thing the camp did is they brought in a former middleweight boxing champion named Werner Samuel. And Chapow beat him very, very quickly, knocked him unconscious, and the camp was very upset about this. Chapow was then sent to another concentration camp called Stutthof. And when the Jews got off the freight cars at Stutthof, the SS men were waiting for them. And they sang a terrible song that, that welcomed all the Jews into Stutthof. The song goes, Jews go through the Red Sea, the waves close in, and the world is happy. Jews are drowned. That was what welcomed Nathan Chapow into the Stutthof concentration camp. From there, he was sent to another camp called Magdeburg. And that camp was uh, surrounded by a lot of water. And when that camp was being liberated, the camp guards did, were not able to evacuate all the Jews into a death march. So they machine gunned 50,000 of them. Chapow once again avoided death and he escaped with others as allies were closing in on the camp. He managed to make, him, make his way eventually to a displaced person camp where he was taken care of. And from there, he went to Palestine, what was then uh, Palestine. And while he was in Jerusalem, he encountered a man from Riga who had stolen his mother's money and his brother's money, pretending that he would get them exit visas so they could escape the Nazis. And a Schaphaus mother and brother were killed in a concentration camp. When he came across this man in Jerusalem, he beat him to within an inch of his life. And, and then he decided to stay in, in Palestine and fight for Israel's independence. He joined uh, the Ergon and fought with them. And then he joined the Israeli Defense Forces and fought with them in the War of Independence in 1948. He met his future wife there. He married her. They moved to Chicago. They had two children, Mike and Adina. And from there, they moved to Los Angeles, where Nathan opened a very successful trucking company. The third person that I interviewed was a Greek boxer named Salomo Aruk. He was an extremely proficient boxer who won the Greek middleweight championship when he was only 17 years old. He was from Salonka, which because it had the largest Jewish population of any city in Greece, it was known as the mother of Israel. The, the uh, Greek soldiers of whom uh, Salomo Aruk was one fought against the initial uh, fascist invasion and they were able to repel the fascists. However, the Nazis re-engaged the uh, Greek troops and they defeated them. And they sent a, a, a terrible man to uh, Salonika to deal with the Jews. His name was Alois Bruner. His job was to round up as many Jews as possible 
and then to send them to concentration camps. After the war, by the way, Bruna fled to Syria, where his job was to train the Syrian soldiers how to torture and execute captured Israeli soldiers. When uh, on March 15th, 1943, Salamo, his father, his mother, his sisters, and his brother all arrived at Auschwitz. As soon as they arrived, all but Salamo were taken to a gas chamber and killed. It was boxing that kept him alive there. And as, as with the other two fighters, he was initially put into a ring with a man who was much uh, bigger and tougher than he was, uh, a fighter from Czechoslovakia. And Aruk was able to beat him. And uh, this caused no end of problems for him because the Nazis were very upset that these men proved so proficient, even on almost starvation diets, they were able to, to go ahead and continue fighting. Ultimately, the Nazis brought in a boyhood friend of Aruk named Jacko Razan, who had won 128 fights in Greek. And the Allies were hoping, uh, I'm sorry, the Nazis were hoping that these two men would pummel each other and no one would come out alive. Fortunately for Jacko and Aruk, the Allies were able to free the camp before the fight was to take place. After the war, Aruk went to Palestine. He too joined the IDF and fought for Israel in 1948 and again in the Six Day War in 1967. He died there of a stroke in 2009. Now, the next person I'm going to tell you about was not a Jewish boxer, he was a gypsy boxer. And uh, technically, he was, they call, they're called Sintai. They're either Sintai or Romas, uh, of the uh, gypsies. They don't particularly like the term gypsy. He, uh, as a child, was bullied for being different from the Aryan children in his classes. He was swarthy. He had uh, dark hair. It, it was very curly. Uh, he just didn't look like an Aryan. And, and for that reason, he was uh, tormented by his classmates. His father uh, decided that he would send him to a boxing gym to learn boxing so that he could defend himself against the bullies in his class. He did very well in that, uh, and he was uh, thereafter decided to become a professional. And he was trained by a major Jewish boxing champion in Germany named Eric Seelig. And he was so good that he was considered the top lightweight heavyweight, the light heavyweight contender in, in Germany. But because he was a Sintai and not an Aryan, he was denied the opportunity to participate in the 1928 Olympics. He also had a style of boxing that was very reminiscent of Muhammad Ali, whereas most German boxers would stand in the center of a ring, flat-footed, and trade punches with their opponents. Johann Trollmann would dance around the ring and almost make fun of his opponents, challenging them. He was so swift on his feet that his opponents were barely able to land a punch. He was put in a ring against the light heavyweight boxing champion of Germany, a man named Adolf Witt, who he beat soundly. However, the Nazi Boxing Commission refused to give Johann Trollmann the title. They, they said that he, he didn't win the fight fairly. But there was so much outrage at this that they had to reschedule the fight again. And the Nazis told Johann Trollmann that if he won again against Adolf Witt, that he would be executed. So he fought again, and he, he did as he was told. He would fight flat-footed and not uh, dance around the ring. However, he entered the ring as a parody of an Aryan. He dyed his hair blonde, and he covered his body with white powder so that he would look like an Aryan. This caused a lot of laughs, but nevertheless, he lost the fight. And after that, he was drafted into the army. He was sent to fight on the western, um, um, on the eastern front of, of Germany, where he was badly wounded. And because he was wounded, he was dishonorably discharged. While he was at home, recovering from his wounds, he received notice 
that he was no longer used to the German army and therefore he would be sent to a concentration camp. He was sent to a camp called the Nunagama concentration camp where he was so badly beaten by the guards that they thought he was dead. However, there were many people at the camp who loved and admired Johann and they arranged for him to get the identity of someone who really had been killed. And they gave him the new man's identity. And from there, he was shipped to another camp called the Wittenberg camp. He was recognized there and forced to fight uh, for his life. And one of the people he was forced to fight was a hated capo named Emil Cornelius. And he beat the capo very badly. Cornelius was so upset and humiliated by this defeat that he gave Trollman terrible jobs to do, backbreaking jobs to do, and, and, and did everything he could to, to make Trollman's life miserable. One day, he stood up behind Trollman with a club and clubbed him to death. Trollman was 36 years old. After he was died, he was cremated, and his parents were sent a bill for the cremation. The next back, uh, boxer I wrote about was a man named Harry Haft, who I'd come across when I was uh, doing the research for my first boxing Jewish book, which was called Max Baer and Barney Ross, Jewish Heroes of Boxing. He grew up in Poland, and when he was a young man uh, and the Nazis had come to power, he was taken by a, an SS soldier who put his hand in a doorway and slammed it against his knuckles and broke all the knuckles in his hand. He was sent to Auschwitz and there his job was throwing gassed bodies into the ovens. And he had to do it with another Jewish man. <clears throat> and they did this for hours and hours as the bodies came out of the gas chambers, they, they were given them and, and, they, and the bodies were incinerated. One day, there was a man who hadn't died in the gas chambers. And it was his time to be pushed into the ovens. And Harry Half did not want to do that. He saw the man was still alive. His eyes were open. And the guard there said to Harry Half that, that if he didn't push the man into the oven, the guard would shoot Harry Half and, and kill him at, 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 at that spot. And Harry Half was haunted by this for, uh, for the rest of his life. And yet he was also forced to fight for his life. And he had 76 fights in Auschwitz and he won every single one of them. And to make, to, to almost humiliate him in a way, the, the guards forced Jewish musicians uh, to sit outside his boxing ring and play upbeat music while Harry Haft was pummeling his opponents. In one night, he was forced to fight six men and he defeated all of them. And this is a man who was living on a potato soup and, and, and the potato soup didn't have much of a potato in it. One night, he and a good friend of his decided they, they were going to escape from Auschwitz. They just couldn't stand it anymore. And they managed to get a pair of uh, German uniforms and disguised themselves. And they ran out of the um, camp. They got past the Jewish guards who thought they were Germans and let them, uh, the uh, German guards and let them out of the camp. Uh, as they were running, there were shots being fired at them. And Harry fell into a ditch and his friend fell into the ditch on top of him. His friend had been shot and killed. Harry didn't realize it at the time. Two SS guards arrived at the ditch, and one of the guards said that he was going to fire his bullets into the two bodies lying there. The other guard said to him, don't waste your bullets. They're too valuable. They're obviously dead. And they walked back to the camp. Haft waited in the, in, in the ditch until the following night when, when he extricated himself and, and, and escaped. His intention was to walk to Poland and, 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 and find Americans who could help him. On the way, he crossed over a small river and he saw a German soldier bathing in the river. The German 
soldier had left his clothes and his weapons on the shore of the river. And he recognized Harry as a Jew. But just to make sure, he yelled out, are you a Juden? And Harry realized what was in store for him. And he picked up the man's rifle and shot and killed him. Then he took the man's uniform and he dressed in a uniform and made his way eventually to a displaced persons camp. They thought that he was a German soldier. He couldn't speak English. The only languages he could speak were Yiddish and Pol Polish. And no one in, in, the, in the DP camp, none of the Americans could speak those languages. However, they did find an American soldier who was conversant in Yiddish and was able to interview Harry and learn, in fact, that he had that he had been a prisoner at Auschwitz and was only disguising himself in a Nazi's uniform. From the deep DP camp, Harry sailed to New York. And he, because he had no profession, had been in a camp since he was 16 years old, he decided that he would become a boxer. That was all he knew from the camp. And in New York, he hired a manager who's not the greatest manager in the world. And Harry had a number of fights a number of amateur fights, and then a number of professional fights. Finally, on July 18, 1949, he was scheduled to fight the future heavyweight boxing champion of the world, Rocky Marciano, at the Rhode Island Auditorium. Just prior to the bout, two mafia soldiers came into his dressing room, and they told him that if he didn't lose the fight by the third round, they would kill him. And to prove their point, they let him know that another boxer who refused to take a dive three weeks earlier had also been killed. Harry took the dive and, and, and it, it was the end of his boxing career. In, in a way, it was the end of his career as, as, as a human being because he was so bitter, so embittered by what happened to him. Here's a man who survived 76 fights in Auschwitz, and now the mafia comes and they tell him he can't fight in America, that his career is over. He opened a fruit and vegetable store in Brooklyn, got married, had two sons, and treated his family terribly. He was a very bitter, very angry, very unhappy man. And he took out his anger on his family. It was not until his sons were mature that they understood why their father behaved the way they did. And one of his sons, Alan, wrote a beautiful letter to his father, forgiving him, saying that he finally understood all the torments that his father had gone through and he forgave him and he loved his father and he hoped that the rest of his life would be rewarding. And he would do whatever he could to make his father's plight known to the rest of the world. And he arranged for his father's biography to, to be published, which it was. And then he arranged for a movie to be made about his father's life, which was directed by Barry Levinson. And it was shown on HBO last year, a movie called The Survivor. Now, in addition to those boxers whom I wrote about, I also wrote about two men who escaped from Auschwitz. The first one I wrote about was a man named Rudy Verber whose original name was Walter Rosenberg. He was a brilliant, brilliant biochemist. And in 1942, he was arrested and sent to Auschwitz. He, he was arrested because he had tried uh, after the Nazis uh, conquered Slovakia, wh where he was from, he tried to leave uh, Slovakia and join the Czech army, which was fighting against uh, the, the Nazis. And on the way to join the Czech army, he was arrested. And that's when he was sent to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, he met a man named Alfred Wetzler. And the two of them decided that they would escape one night. And they managed to pull off a very daring escape in 1944. And also uh, by pretending to, uh, uh, to be Nazis and, 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 and almost walking out of the camp. However, uh, they were discovered, their, their departure was discovered, and there was a major manhunt out looking for them. The two men 
managed to walk their way back to Slovakia, where they were hidden by Jews in a, a, a Catholic church, upstairs in a Catholic church, where they wrote a report about all the atrocities that were being committed by the Nazis in, in Auschwitz. And while they were there, they had learned that Hungarian Jews from the countryside of Hungary were being sent to Auschwitz in very large numbers. In fact, 434,000 Hungarian Jews had been sent to Auschwitz and they were, they were killed as soon as they arrived. They were just sent into the gas chambers. Verber and uh, Wetzler knew that next to be rounded up were 200,000 Jews from Budapest. So they quickly wrote this report and they gave it to a Latin American diplomat named George Mantello, who brought it to the Swiss consulate. And the Swiss published this report in their newspapers and it was picked up also by the Associated Press. It was published in New York in the Herald Tribune and in the New York Times. It was published in England. It was published in all over Switzerland and in many large cities throughout the United States. This uh, uh, created an, an enormous protests and the uh, Nazi puppet head of Hungary, uh, a man named Hortai, that was his last name, Hortai, was besieged to stop the, the transport of the uh, Budapest Jews. And to make sure that he did, the British and the Americans bombed military posts in and around Budapest, not only Nazi posts, but also Hungarian uh, military posts and government facilities. That prevented the 200,000 Jews from Budapest being deported. And um, Wetzler and, and And, 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 and Verba was celebrated after this. After the war, Verba went to London where he became a celebrated biochemist and, and then to Canada. He also was invited to testify at the trial of Adolf Eichmann and other Nazi war criminals. The other uh, man who escaped from Auschwitz was not Jewish, he was, in fact, a Polish aristocrat named Witold Pilecki. He was uh, violently anti-Nazi, violently anti-fascist, and, and fought as part of the Polish underground army against the uh, Nazi invasion of Poland. And he had heard rumors about what was going on in Auschwitz. And remarkably, he put himself in a position where he would be arrested and sent to Auschwitz. And there he issued reports smuggled back to the Polish Home Army in exile in London. And he also built a, uh, it was like a, a shortwave radio that he was able to transmit reports about what was going on in, in, in Auschwitz. And he, he asked the, uh, Polish Home Army to, to try and get soldiers, not only from Poland, but from allied forces to either bomb Auschwitz or to send in paratroopers and liberate it. The Polish Home Army didn't have the facility of the manpower to do this, and the allies, it wasn't a high priority for them. So that never happened. In, um, in 1942, he had to dismantle his... Uh, radio because the nazis had heard about it from someone at the camp who who told him about it he and three other men decided that they would escape from uh, auschwitz and on april 27 1943 four men also disguised as as nazis bar, uh, stole a nazi vehicle and they were passed through the gates of Auschwitz because they it looked like a, a, a Nazi car driven by Nazi soldiers. Uh, they, when they got far enough away, they abandoned the car and the four men went their separate ways. They fed, felt that that was a better way 
of eluding the Nazis by each one going in a different direction. So that if one got caught, he wouldn't know where the others were, and he couldn't testify against them, he couldn't reveal any information. Witold Pilecki made his way back to Warsaw, and he rejoined the fight against the Nazis. In addition to that, he helped to hide Jews who were still living in Warsaw, and he gave a number of Jewish families money so that they could bribe people to escape into the underground. And he um, eventually, uh, he, he, he was captured by the Nazis after the failure of the Warsaw Uprising. And he was sent to a labor camp, but he was liberated from that at the end of the war and returned to Poland. However, Stalin was moving communists all over Eastern Europe after the war. And Pilecki was as much an anti-communist as he had been an anti-fascist. And he was arrested by the Soviet police and he was tortured, terribly tortured. And they pulled out his fingernails, his toenails. They put electric wires on his testicles. They hung him upside down and, and bled him to, for, for a while. Uh, and they forced him to sign a fallacious confession saying that he was a traitor to, to, to the communist ideals. And he was executed and he became a non-person after that. It wasn't until the Soviets left Poland in the 1980s that Witold Pilecki was recognized as a hero. And there's now a statue of him in Krakow celebrating his heroism. And the other person I want to, uh, I wrote about was a very interesting man named Abba Kovner. Abba Kovner was a, um, a man from Vilna, Lithuania. He was one of the first people in the Jewish community in Vilna to realize what the Nazis intention was that they were going to kill all the Jews. And he wrote a manifesto in 1942 entitled, let us not go like lambs to the slaughter. And most of the Jews were skeptical of this. They didn't believe that genocide would take place. They thought he was being extreme, that he was being overly dramatic. However, there were about 400 Jews who did believe him. And he helped to smuggle a lot of them out of the uh, Vilna ghetto. And for the ones that were left, he helped to smuggle in arms so that they could fight against uh, the, the Nazis. And they formed something called the United Partisans Organization in 1943 to fight against the Nazis. And they all escaped out of the ghetto. And for a while, they, they fought with uh, Russian troops uh, against the Nazis. And then they went into the forests and, and, and they fought by themselves. They formed a group called, in Hebrew, it's called Nakam. And in English, they were known as the Avengers. And they, beginning at the last year of the war, up until 1951, they killed about 1,500 Nazi war criminals. They would go to their homes, say that uh, uh, dressed in British uniforms, dri driving a British military car, and they would tell the war criminal that you're wanted for questioning at British headquarters, please come with us. The war criminal would reluctantly go. They would drive to a forest. They would tell the man to get out of the car. They'd march him into the woods. They'd kneel him down. They'd say, you know the crimes you committed and now you have to pay for it. And they would shoot the man in the head and kill him. Um, after the war, the Nakam also had one point wanted to poison 6 million German citizens for the 6 million Jews that were killed. And that was the, the, the Israeli hierarchy vetoed that. They said this was a terrible thing to do. And if you did it, you would only bring tremendous blame onto the Jews. So instead, the Avengers decided that they would poison all the 
SS soldiers in a Nazi barrack uh, in Germany. And what they did is they were able to gain admission and gain control of a nearby bakery. And they had a, a tremendous amount of arsenic with them. And they were able to mix the arsenic with, with mustard and other uh, foodstuffs. And they spread it on bread that would be eaten uh, by these Nazi soldiers. However, they spread it too thinly and none of the Nazis died. About 2000 of them got very sick and 200 had to go to the hospital, but none of them uh, uh, died from this. After the war and after his adventures were over, Kovner went to Israel. He joined the Haganah. He also testified against Adolf Eichmann and a number of other Nazi war criminals. He became a celebrated poet in Israel and is considered one of the greatest poets in the Hebrew language from Israel in the 20th century. Anyway, that's the story of my book. And I would be very happy to answer whatever questions any of you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Really interesting. And and actually, um, I have one. I have one question myself. Um, okay. On the museum, um, and then a couple other questions. So my question is in reference to um, your research, and I'm wondering if you had um, um, in your research found other boxers that had different experiences in the Holocaust, just not um, in the camps themselves. It, 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 there have been a large number of Jewish boxers in, in Germany who, who had reached uh, championship positions and they were all forced out of Germany. Many of them fled. That one I mentioned, Eric Seelig, um, he wound up coming to America and he, he became a farmer in, in, in America. He never had a career again as, 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 as a boxer. There were, there were several other uh, Jewish boxers who had to fight in the concentration camps and often uh, they were killed uh, before they could go on to win numerous other fights. And, and a lot of those boxes, unfortunately, remain anonymous uh, to, to this day. We don't know who they are. Very interesting. I, I ask because in the museum's collection, we have um, some items related to a boxer named uh, Sam Luko or Sam Levkovich, who ended up going uh -huh. to Shanghai as a Jewish refugee and, and fought actually, actually fought Japanese boxers until he was too successful and they shut down boxing in the Shanghai ghetto. So <laughs> um, it's, it's oh, just that's an very interesting. interesting little bit of history. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's fascinating. I, yeah. Um, so another question that I had was just about your research. Where did you, were you able to speak with family members of these individuals or did you go to, for instance, you know, the, the archives at Auschwitz or, or similar archives? I was able to interview uh, Alan Haft, the son of Harry Haft, who sent me a number of photographs, some of which are in my book. And he sent me a, a beautiful letter that he wrote to his father, which I also reprinted in my book. And then I interviewed Morris Chapow, the son of uh, Nathan Chapow, who sent me also photographs and documents uh, ab about his father. And the information I got from these two people was just uh, uh, terrific. And Victor Perez uh, did not have any family and, and neither did um, uh, Yo Yo Johan Trollman anymore. And however, I was able to get a lot of newspaper and magazine articles from the 1930s and early 1940s. Um, and though they were not in languages that I could read, I was able to get them translated. And, and that's so I found out a lot of biographical information about the people th th that I wrote about because they were in their own way celebrities in their time. And there was a lot of information that had been published in France, in Germany, in Poland, in, in uh, Lithuania. And, and it was just extraordinary being able to get those documents and having them translated for me. 
Very interesting. As a um, as someone who does that sort of research and works with uh, documents like that, I'm always interested to see how other people use use them. Um, and um, our last question, my last question is related to um, all of the boxers, whether it's um, the ones you mentioned or or uh, um, others that you maybe researched but didn't mention during this program. Um, be, for the ones who survived, um, you know, besides Haft, were there others that continued their boxing career after after liberation? None of the ones who were in the camps continued their boxing careers after the camps. The history of Jewish boxing in America is fascinating because from 1910 to 1941, there were over 400 Jewish boxers in America, and there were two dozen world champions. But after World War II, there were no more Jewish boxers, basically. The Jewish boxing experience in America was basically the story of the children of immigrants who found a way of making money quickly without having to resort to crime or, 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 or menial labor. And, 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 and a lot of them were, went on to have unusually successful careers after they gave up boxing. They were very smart and, and, and they used the money that they had made as boxers to invest in very solid businesses. And that most of them became very successful businessmen after the war. Very good. And one last question, what's your next project? You're a very prolific writer, so what's <laughs> the horizon? My, my next project is not a, a Jewish project. It's, it's about the gangsters who uh, made Las Vegas and controlled it and, 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 and ran it for 40 years. Some of whom, by the way, were Jewish. <laughs> very interesting. People do are very interested in in the mafia and all of those types of subjects. So they absolutely are. To that too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, um, Jeffrey. And I just want to thank everybody who's joining us online tonight. Thank you so much for spending this hour with us. And I want to remind you about that survey that you'll see um, coming up on your screen right after I'm done. You'll see a QR code. If you scan it with the camera on your phone, it'll take you to an online survey. So thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.